Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm, I'm pleased today to present about um, our program called Architectural Conservation and Sustainability Engineering. I'm going to give a bit of an overview of the, the program, as well as um, some sort of inspirational slides that uh, kind of give an appreciation to what our students will be faced with in the real world and some of the challenges of buildings. Um, so my name is Liam O'Brien and I have been a professor for this program now for 11 years and it started 11 years ago. Um, so I was the first hire for the program um, and hopefully I can answer all of your questions because um, I have a pretty good understanding of the program. Okay. Um, so this program started out of strong market demand. Um, so it's not one of the traditional engineering um, disciplines like civil engineering or mechanical or environmental or electrical. Um, it's really um, something newer that fills the gaps because there's this gap where um, there, there's a lack of experts in buildings that sort of understand buildings holistically. Um, so civil engineers deal largely with structural engineering. Um, mechanical engineers deal with the mechanical systems like heating and cooling and, and piping um, and, and sprinkler systems, but we don't have someone to fill the, the gap between those and actually to understand all of them. Um, and so that's where this program came in. So it was really um, government and consulting companies that said to Carlton, we need experts um, who understand buildings more holistically and not just new buildings, but also uh, existing buildings. And so I've got a picture here of um, the center block at, Carl at uh, in Ottawa. Um, and this building and this project alone can take up the entire capacity of all of our graduates to give a sense of um, the level of market demand. Um, and of course, there's a lot more projects going on than just this one. So, I just want to give a little bit of an overview of the program and then we'll go into some details. So there's two intertwined specializations in this program as, as the title might suggest. One is in conservation. Um, and this deals with understanding and measuring existing buildings, understanding their structures, um, the materials, the techniques that were used a long time ago before um, building codes or, or before the current building codes at least. Um, so understanding materials, structural integrity, um, modeling the buildings to understand where they might fail and reinforcing those um, deficiencies, et cetera. Um, also the cultural aspects, which our students gather um, from various courses outside of engineering. The other specialization is in sustainability. And so this deals with how do we um, design and construct and operate a building efficiently considering um, things like energy efficiency, comfort, uh, impact on the environment, and so on. And the program has about six architecture courses, well, specifically six architecture courses, um, six program-specific courses that are very specialized. We'll get into that later. Um, but it's also based largely on the civil engineering program. So our students develop a lot of the skills and knowledge um, that are fundamental to civil engineering, focus mainly on the structural aspects. Uh, but then with a strong specialization. And generally that leads to students that are, I think, a little bit better rounded. And so they understand architects, they work closely with architecture students and take courses taught by architects or, or architecture professors. Um, but it's also a little bit more specialized than some of the more general engineering programs like uh, civil engineering or mechanical engineering. Um, and like every engineering program at Carleton, there's a co-op option available. Um, the main co-op term is a 16 month term right after the students finish third year, um, but before they go into fourth year. So whereas most students would have a four month summer between third year and fourth year, co-op students or people uh, doing the co-op option will have a 16 month term. Um, so basically a, a full year plus the summer. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about the people involved in the program. So typically the number of students coming in is 40 to 50. Um, I'm pleased to say that we've seen quite a bit of growth in, in recent years. So this number is actually upward, um, something like 70, um, which I think is just a reflection of 
aid the demands and, and the perceived demand of this area. Um, but also the fact that we're growing and our facilities are growing and we have more professors than ever and so on. Um, unlike a lot of engineering disciplines, our ratio of males to females is about 50-50, uh, which I think is one of the strengths of the program. Um, and we have a mix of domestic and international students. Um, I can't say what the, the ratio is exactly. I think something like two thirds domestic. Um, we have very strong graduate students and teaching assistants because those teaching assistants come from um, people that I supervise and that my colleagues supervise. And so we have a lot of graduate students that are excellent, um, that are studying buildings in a master's or PhD level. And they teach our undergraduate students or, or they support um, the teaching of our undergraduate students, things like tutorials and labs and other hands-on activities. Um, and I wanted to note, we have a new um, master's and PhD program in building engineering, or it should be starting in September next year. Um, and this is important because a lot of our students want to continue on to graduate studies, to specialize in research, um, or even specialize in um, a particular topic that they learned in their undergraduate degree. Um, some of our students also do masters in architecture, which is kind of a unique path um, because you need a undergraduate degree in engineering to become a professional engineer. You need a master's in architecture to become a professional uh, architect. So with that combination, you could be in theory, a professional engineer and architect. Um, these photos are the core five faculty members that teach in the program. Um, but of course, there's many others. These are just the ones that were hired specifically with expertise in buildings, um, either kind of in the sustainability area or more in the heritage conservation area. So just to provide a bit of an overview of, of this program and, and its basis, I think it's useful to look at the building life cycle. And so this means from the beginning, um, from, from raw material extraction all the way to the end of life of the building. Um, and so we can represent this as a loop. So we extract raw materials fr from the ground or fr from trees or so on. Um, and then we manufacture these into uh, materials that we would build with. And then um, we have design and construction. Then there's the operation phase, which is usually the longest part of the life cycle. Um, and then there may be demolition, but one of the premises of our program is that a lot of buildings deserve to be reused, especially if they have um, heritage aspects or they just have useful lives beyond their original purpose. Um, so the way we could sort of see this program a little bit is that the, the design and construction and, and operating phase of buildings is kind of under the sustainability side. And Closing that loop rather than going out to demolition is more on the conservation side. But what we like to say is that these are actually very intertwined topics because um, it is more sustainable to conserve our buildings rather than to go down that demolition route. Um, and the other important thing to note is that in Canada every year, we're only building about 250,000 new buildings, including houses. Most of those would be houses. Um, but the existing building stock is something like 14 million. Um, so it's really important for our students to develop expertise in looking at old buildings or existing buildings and not just new buildings. We're not going to resolve our problems by only addressing new buildings. So let's look a little bit at the program from a, a four year perspective. So the first year is focused on fundamentals. Um, and these are things like math and science, chemistry, physics. Um, but we have a few courses that are uh, in architecture. We also have a few courses that give our students sort of some breadth and some, some early understanding of what this program is about. Um, so for example, I teach a course that's sort of a survey course where we have 12 guest speakers in, um, people from industry, people who manage Carleton buildings, um, people who are working on research, and some of the other professors. Um, so this allows our students to have an understanding of um, what they're going to do in four years, because admittedly, first year is a little bit fundamental um, and not so specific to the program. 
And, and the good thing about that is that, well, fundamentals are important and, and foundational and you can't become an engineer without knowing the fundamentals. The other thing is there's some versatility in switching disciplines. So if we made first year very specific, um, there wouldn't be that versatility. Second year gets a little bit more applied and there's still fundamentals, um, but we started having courses like architectural technology, um, heritage conservation, architecture and the environment. And there's also some skills or some courses that, that develop skills that are not as technical, things like communication skills for engineers, which are obviously um, very important and probably, probably more important than the technical for many people. Third year uh, gets more specific. So then we're getting heavily into structures, building science, um, wood engineering, architectural technology, also some um, more general engineering topics like engineering economics. Um, the fourth year is the optional co-op term. Um, and then we get to fourth year, um, which is very focused. So um, courses that basically perfectly aligned with the program. Um, and there's also a fourth year design project, which is an eight month um, project where teams of about five or six students work with um, one professor and possibly an industry partner or government to solve a real problem. And I'll, by the way, I, I should have said, I'll be happy to answer questions at the end. You're welcome to chat uh, or uh, ask via the Q&A. Um, and we have a few people answering those. Um, but I think I'll get through the slides to make room for some time at the end. Um, so one of the things, my, my little tip to you, if you're kind of trying to decide what engineering discipline you might like to consider, and you're a bit on the fence, we have these things, they're one page documents called progression trees, and they show all of the courses involved in each program. Um, so it's very easy to Google this if you just type something like Carlton progression tree. Um, I also have a URL on this page, which I, I can put in the, the chat later. Um, this one is for architectural conservation and sustainability engineering, but it allows you to see exactly which course is scheduled and when. Um, and an obvious question might be, can you deviate from this? Can you, can you uh, expand the degree slightly? Um, some students like to work part-time on the side and things like that. Um, and yes, there's some flexibility to do that. Um, but the, the beauty of these charts, which look very complex, admittedly, maybe they are, um, when you first see them, is that they show all the prerequisites, which means that you can be very strategic about which courses to delay uh, till the summer, for example, versus which courses you must take on schedule. So I, I'd like to talk a little bit about the co-op program. So this is completely optional. Um, and whether or not you do it, well, we do have a requirement that you maintain a B uh, in your first two years in order to be eligible for the co-op program. Um, but even if you do that, it's not obvious, I think, for everyone whether you should do it or not. Um, the perk is that it gives you real experience. You you earn real money, quite quite uh, respectable money, something like um, in the in the forty to sixty thousand dollar a year range. So so plenty of money. Um, but it delays your education, and um, I'll give you. My example, I, I knew I wanted to go to graduate school and I had a job offer. I didn't go to Carleton, I went elsewhere. Um, but my job offer was not that interesting. It involved sourcing electrical components and finding the best price for them. And I decided that's not a great use of my life. <laughs> so I, I went right through and uh, and I'm, I'm quite glad for it. But one of the benefits of doing co-op is that it gives you a bit of a shoe in potentially an advantage for longer term employment afterwards because you've built a relationship. And the other thing is that future employers might uh, like to see that, that our students have some real working experience. Um, it's not all about the technical, of course, it's also about um, time management and communication skills and knowing how to work with others and, and understanding what an engineering office is all about. 
Um, so while we don't guarantee positions for our students, there is a high probability of getting a position. Um, and anecdotally, I could say there's there's lots of demand for our students because there are not a lot of programs like this. Um, yet the construction industry is booming, both for existing and new buildings. Um, so I'd like to kind of uh, change pace a little bit and look at just some photos from our program um, or other buildings we study. So this is an example of a sort of a field study or, or lab study. This is the, the canal uh, right beside Carleton, of course. Um, Carleton's privileged to be beside a UNESCO heritage site. Um, and so this is an example of our students uh, doing some surveying and photogrammetry to understand the geometry and the features and the, the heritage um, characteristics of the site. Here's another, I think this is the same site, um, just a different view. Um, and this is called a total station, which is sort of a, a surveying piece of equipment. So our students have a lot of hands-on experience with equipment well before they graduate. Here's another site our students studied. This is a house in Ottawa. And so um, the beauty of our program is that our, our lab is kind of the, the surrounding city and beyond um, and campus, of course. And so a lot of our um, lab activities and hands-on activities involve going off campus to measure um, neighboring heritage or new buildings. And so this is what's called a point cloud. Um, and it's basically something that's generated by um, 3D scanning the uh, environment and then and then uh, superimposing photographs on top of that. So this is something produced by undergraduate students. One of our professors is is particularly world famous. Um, he travels the world even now. He just got back from Europe, um, and he's recognized for um, studying very old. Uh, buildings or other pieces of infrastructure. And so this is him, Mario Santana, um, on a site in Egypt. And I won't say every undergraduate student gets to go to, to Egypt and, and go into historic sites, um, but there are plenty of opportunities, um, and particularly at the graduate level, but in some cases at the undergraduate level. Um, this is just an example of a, a building we study in one of my courses. This is a university building in the tropics, um, but they've used solar panels to double, well, for, for producing electricity, but also to shade a courtyard to keep people more comfortable. Um, here's that same building. And we studied this because I want the students to understand some of the techniques that are being used elsewhere and how they can be applied um, to the Canadian climate. Um, so this is the same university building, and um, this is a place called Reunion Island, which is a little bit off the coast of Madagascar. And what's interesting about this climate is that it's so hot there um, that they not only shade the windows to prevent solar radiation from coming in the windows, they actually shade the outside of the building. And so that's what you can sort of see on the right here. Um, is some, some louvers to shade the windows and the facade in general. But the reason they're shaped this way with a sort of horizontal orientation is to let lots of air flow through. Um, because what they managed to do in this building is use no air conditioning, just allow lots of breezes through um, to provide a, a cooling sensation. This is the inside of one of the classrooms and you can see windows with that same sort of horizontal louver pattern to allow lots of airflow through over all the students um, and also some ceiling fans. This is another building um, that has a similar shape, not by coincidence, but this one's in Colorado. Uh, and I'd say this is my favorite building. Um, it's called the Research Support Facility. It's part of um, the National Renewable Energy Lab. And it is designed to be net zero energy, which means it produces as much energy on site as it uses over the course of a year. Um, and they have all sorts of impressive techniques, quite innovative uh, for achieving this. So we'll look right at the inside of the building. Um, so on the roof, you can see large solar panels, but that's only part of the, the secret to achieving net zero energy. Um, 
the office spaces are especially smart, I think. And so um, they have modestly sized windows to allow lots of daylight in without um, overheating the space. This is a, a climate that um, could overheat uh, or, or the buildings could overheat. Um, the other neat feature is that they um, reflect solar radiation onto the, the ceiling so that daylight gets much deeper than it normally would. So there's some, some strategically oriented um, uh, louvers that are sort of mirror-like and get the daylight deep into the space, about three times deeper than in a normal building. Um, and that's another view showing how the, the daylight gets deep into the space. And that's the, the daylight reflected up onto the ceiling. So the ceiling is very high. It's also white colored um, to reflect lots of light and allow it to get deep into the space. At the same time, they provide ventilation to the space under the floor um, using a, a unique technique called um, displacement ventilation, where they sort of trickle clean outdoor air at the floor level. And then it, that that clean, slightly cooler air pools uh, because it's heavier than the average air. And when it encounters a person, that person warms up the air a little bit, just enough to bring a, a plume of clean um, kind of outdoor air around the person. So instead of ventilating the space, we're really ventilating um, spaces around people. We also heavily rely on Carleton buildings for our research, uh, and we do a lot of field studies and, and field measurements. I teach a course called Indoor Environmental Quality, and we um, do lots of field studies and take instrumentation around and, and measure things to see our spaces healthy and safe uh, and comfortable. We also talk to occupants. Um, so I'll just give one example of one of the things my students discovered which is um, we realized a lot of people were covering their, their motion sensors in their offices. And we wondered why. You could see that this is a, a nicely daylit building, lots of big windows, beautiful views over the river. Why would people cover their motion sensors? It just didn't make sense. Um, the reason was that the lights were coming on automatically and people didn't like that. There was plenty of daylight and people didn't like the lights coming on. Um, but we wouldn't have known that if we hadn't talked to the people. So that's one of the, the strategies I push is something called post-occupancy evaluation. You talk to the occupants and you can learn a lot that way. Um, so we, one of my uh, PhD students and I resolved this issue because we realized that a very simple switch, um, maybe that's not the best term, a very, a very simple tweak to the controls so that the lights did not come on automatically. Instead, someone um, pushes a button and the lights come on, that saved about 95% on energy use. So it's not always complex, um, technology-heavy solutions that save energy. In this case, it was a matter of a, a 10-second intervention that saved um, thousands of dollars a year in electricity. Um, other things we've seen and my students have seen is uh, people covering um, diffusers because they don't like dust or, or breezes uh, or drafts, um, covering windows because they don't like the glare, um, covering lights, which is arguably a bit of a fire hazard, again, because they don't like the direct light. I've also had students do um, field studies in people's homes. Here's an example where we studied a condo in, in downtown Ottawa, and our students discovered that it's a really uncomfortable space because um, this bedroom has a lot of windows and the bed fills up almost the entire space, which means that the occupant in this place has to basically brush up against this cold window to get out of bed. Um, and we use something called thermal imaging, which allows us to measure the temperature of surfaces using a, a specialized camera. And this is just a funny photo that I, I quite like because it, it kind of shows the lack of um, consideration of occupants when buildings are designed. Uh, and this is something I advocate for not doing, obviously. So what we're looking at is a condo 
Um, and they put a very large window in this room, which happens to be the bathroom. So the poor occupant is completely exposed. Um, and of course, they keep the blind closed for privacy. But one might ask, why did we provide this big window when uh, the blind is going to stay closed permanently? This is really uh, not good from an energy perspective, never mind the privacy considerations. Changing um, base a little bit or changing location, um, here's another group of buildings that we study extensively in uh, a couple of our courses. These are called Earthships. This is just one example. Um, this is in New Mexico, but there are some in Canada um, and, and northern states and Europe and so on. Um, so this type of building has been around since about the 1970s. And the premise is let's use as much recycled material as possible. Um, and also design for the climate and use as few inputs, water, energy, um, et cetera, as possible. And this is a place I stayed. You can, you can stay at one of these. It's just like a hotel. Um, and here's the inside. So these rely a lot on recycled materials, but notably they're, they're buried a little bit underground, not fully, um, but enough that they sort of benefit from the thermal mass of the ground. These spaces, unlike a lot of homes, react very slow thermally um, to the outdoor air temperature, which means that you're not seeing big temperature swings that you see outside in the desert. So it gets very hot during the day and cold during the night. These buildings are designed to try to kind of have a more regular, comfortable temperature. This is um, sort of in the corridor, so it's inside but outside of the rooms, and you can see uh, a few features. So this garden um, actually absorbs wastewater, not from toilets, but from um, sinks and showers, and the, the, the uh, plants use the nutrients that, that come out of that waste stream. Um, and meanwhile, they don't need to be watered because there's plenty of wastewater. Um, the other feature I wanted to show is the extensive use of recycled materials. Most notably here, they used a lot of bottles. Um, these bottles serve two purposes. One, they let light in, in a very kind of cool, um, decorative way. But the other thing they do is displace concrete. So concrete has a lot of embodied um, carbon. It takes a lot of energy to produce concrete. That's why if you're driving along the highway and you see a concrete plant or a cement plant, um, there's usually, usually lots of smokestacks. That's because well, concrete and cement take a lot of energy to produce. And these bottles displace the use of that. So there's, there's less use of concrete. These buildings um, generate their own water. They, they process their own water for drinking and, and other uses. Um, and so there's kind of a, a series of filters. Um, because this is the desert, and I don't know if I have a photo of it. Yes, I do. Um, these, these houses use big cisterns so that when it rains, and it does rain hard there, um, they collect the rain and then they store it for the, the following weeks or months. And you'll note they're made out of tires. Same principle, we wanna use uh, recycled materials that otherwise don't have much purpose. Um, and these are not just regular tires. Well, they are regular tires, uh, but the way they're constructed is that they pound them full of earth or sand so that they come become very heavy um, and structurally sound and so you, then they stack them like bricks and this shows a little bit of a close-up of kind of a wall under construction and a few students from the program have gone down to new mexico to volunteer for this organization that builds uh, housing it's a whole community in taos new mexico um, and here's the outside of the house showing uh, this one house there's lots of houses that look different um, natural ventilation, so allowing air movement through to cool the space um, and collecting electricity and thermal energy um, using these solar thermal collectors. Here's another view of the hallway and this shows these ropes that allow the hatch, which I showed above, the hatches to open up so that you can promote, promote more airflow. And one thing that made me realize the importance of, of thermal mass, which is the sort of thermal inertia, heavy materials that store energy, um, is that in the evening or at night, 
you'd go outside and it was really cold even in the summer. But in this space, it's so comfortable and you can feel the heat coming off of um, the floor and the wall because the sun hit it and charged it um, with energy during the day. More plants, they're growing uh, bananas, I believe, and, and um, tomatoes. This is a bathtub that's all hand formed using Adobe. Um, and this tunnel here, it really just a, a pipe, um, goes fairly deep underground and this is used to bring in uh, cool air. And so the idea is that outdoor air, which is warm during the day, gets cooled as it comes through this culvert or this pipe um, and it supplies air at a much more comfortable temperature. So sort of free air conditioning. Switching to continents, um, this is the Sagrada Familia in uh, Barcelona. And I like this example because, well, it's a very neat building and hopefully some of you had the chance to visit it. Um, but notably the, the design technique way before computer aided design um, was to use this system of sandbags and ropes because it turns out that the optimal um, arch structure matches the way arches um, Kind of fall if, if you have a basically some sagging ropes so um what they did is they, they built this system of sandbags little sandbags and ropes um, and then they have a mirror underneath and then the real design is just the inverse of um of the way gravity sort of pulls that down maybe i'll, I'll skip through this is a personal example this is a, a castle that um belongs to my family or belonged to my family about a thousand years ago in Ireland, uh, but now they've converted it into a um, sort of a medieval times, but slightly more authentic than the North American version. Uh, but this is an example of reusing old architecture for um, modern purposes. Something a little closer to home in Toronto, this is Steam Whistle Brewing, which used to be a, a roundhouse for railways, and now it's a a brewery and uh, and restaurant and a kind of a tourist attraction. Less touristy, another thing our students look at is just retrofitting housing. We have all this housing from um, 50 or more years ago. And the question is, how do we make this more efficient? Um, so our students look at techniques, both on the renewable energy side, but also on things like uh, insulating our homes and, and uh, air leakage and better windows and so on. On a larger scale, we also look at high-rise buildings like these ones here in Toronto. This is um, Peanut Plaza in Northern Toronto, um, which is associated with a lot of housing from about 1970, which is associated with a lot of uh, what we call thermal bridging. So if you have a concrete slab between indoors and outdoors out to the balcony, um, this leaks, it, it leaches a lot of heat just because concrete is very conductive. And we know that because if you touch concrete outside on a cold day, it feels very cold. The reason it feels cold is because it's very good at conducting heat from your hand um, inward. And unfortunately, we're not learning uh, from our mistakes of the 1970s. This is an example um, in Chicago. This is called the Aqua Building. And this is another thermal image showing just how much heat those beautiful balconies are sucking out of the indoors. It's a beautiful building, not thermally great. So one of our premises or one of our, our goals in the program is to really um, embrace the living lab approach of education and research. Um, so we have a building on campus where we documented everything and we, we've, uh, we interviewed and have video lectures um, dating back five years from the very beginning of the design process of this building, the health sciences building. Um, and we have tours of the construction process. We have access to data um, with temperatures and, and power rates and so on in the building. And we have time-lapse construction videos and so on. Basically. We wanted to give our students a full immersive um, environment where they can really understand the building from all these different perspectives. 
So we heard from the architects, the engineers, the contractor, the, the city that hands out permits, et cetera. So our students have access to a wealth of information. I'll just show a couple examples. So hopefully this is working out okay. This is a time-lapse video of the construction process. Um, here's a photo of the construction. This is a few years ago now. Um, this is an example of our students getting to go into the building, onto the construction site, and talk to the contractors. Um, and of course, that opportunity is limited, but we have new buildings going up all the time. Um, so there's always going to be these opportunities. And for this building, we recorded um, all of the tours so students have access to it permanently. We also embrace something called BIM, Building Information uh, Management, which is sort of the, the next version of AutoCAD. This is really a 3D management tool that doesn't only look at geometry, but also uh, material properties and, and general uh, properties of construction materials and, and construction uh, components. What facilities do we have? Uh, we have a lot of facilities. Some of them are traditional lab facilities. Others, again, deal with the campus and beyond um, and, and leverage our networks with local uh, organizations like the Historical Society, um, various building operators like uh, Brookfield Global Integrated Solutions, which manages a lot of the government buildings and so on. Um, so this device is called a Heliodon and this allows our students to understand how the sun hits a building um, at different times of day and year. So you build a scale model, you put it on this table, um, and then you can see how the sun kind of wraps around it um, over the course of a day or the seasons. Um, again, we look at uh, using existing Carleton buildings and, and using instruments like uh, photogrammetry and, and surveying equipment um, like that. Um, we have a green roof, which is fully instrumented, so our students can understand um, the, the water retention and so on of a green roof. Um, in some cases, our students do field studies. This is one in Mexico where, where students went to um, a church in Mexico during one of the spring breaks. And they uh, didn't just have fun in Mexico, but they also did some, some real work. And uh, I'll show some more photos of this later, but our students recently built a tiny house. Um, we also have a research house on campus. This is a bit more of a, a large scale house, which you may have seen if you drove or walked by on uh, Bronson, one of the, the sides of Carleton. Um, and this house is, is fully instrumented um, with lots of sort of high tech features like solar collectors, high performance windows, heat pumps, um, thermal energy storage, and so on. Um, and with architecture, we've built 3D models of a lot of campus. Um, so our students can, can play with these, can um, leverage them for various research activities and so on. So this is the tiny house built a couple of years ago by one of our professors, but led largely by undergraduate students. It's called Northern Nomad. Um, and it currently sits on campus, but it was also built on campus. No one's living in it, unfortunately. Um, so here's just an exploded view of that house. But what started as a fourth year project became a real house. Um, so here's some photos just showing the construction of that. Um, and it, it's largely student built, student designed, um, student fundraised, et cetera. Truly a, a, a wonderful project. And there's the inside. Uh, and our students also worked with industrial design and architecture um, on things like aesthetics and, and fitting a lot of furniture into a small space, um, custom building furniture, et cetera. There's some other activities as well though. Um, so for example, there's something called the Association of Preservation Technologists Competition, which is in essence a, a competition to build um, kind of historic structures um, using historic techniques. In this case, it's a bridge um, that, that 
undergo some testing. Our, our students won um, in 2017 and 19. And there's another photo of it showing the failure. Um, our students recently won a competition in Italy, an international competition to um, recommend a retrofit for this building in Rome. And here they are presenting to a panel of judges. Um, we have some, some uh, activities that are, are not quite so program specific. For example, um, the Carleton Student Engineering Society, um, Solar Decathlon, which is a, a solar building design competition. Um, there's a bridge, bu bridge building competition. There's also another popular one called the Great Northern Concrete Toboggan Race. And um, this involves building a toboggan made out of concrete and racing it down the hill. I promise it's safer than it sounds. Um, student life, I mean, there's lots of activities that, that students can get engaged with. It's not all about engineering. Um, there's also socials and, and uh, site tours and visits and um, sports. You name it. Formal. So one of the questions I get a lot is, what careers can I get from this program? The possibilities are quite endless. And we have strong evidence for that because we've seen where our students end up. And the places are very diverse. Um, I mean, sometimes students work outside of Canada. Um, but within Canada and within Ottawa, the, the main categories are to work for government or in the private sector. Um, and here we just have a list of possible um, jobs, but it, it could be building scientists or engineers, structural engineers, HVAC or lighting designers, um, sustainability consultants, which are very, uh, you know, in very high demand today, again, because of the lack of training opportunities in, in traditional programs. Um, our students might become building restoration specialists, engine, uh, energy modeling experts, project managers, etc. cetera. Um, really anything involving construction, buildings, new and old, um, asset management, research, uh, building envelopes. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a very broad selection of possibilities. I mean, myself, I was trained as an aerospace engineer and look where I ended up. Um, so engineering in general is very versatile. One thing people want to know is about professional engineers and, and how do you get a license? Um, you need an undergraduate degree in engineering and of course our program qualifies for that. Um, so you need a bachelor in engineering um, or applied science at Carleton, it's called a bachelor in engineering. Um, you need to have four years of professional engineering experience under supervised by a professional engineer. Um, you can count 12 months of your co-op experience, assuming it sort of qualifies because of your, your supervision experience. Um, and so that means you only need three years after that. You also need to write a law and ethic, ethics exam which is not too difficult. I, I did it pretty easily, I think. Um, and you need to maintain a Professional Engineers of Ontario membership. Um, a little bit before graduation, you get an engineering ring, an iron ring that looks like, like this one here. Um, once you become a professional engineer, you also get a stamp. And the stamp um, is significant. It means that you can basically stamp uh, drawings and other documents, of course, that comes with some liability as well. Program admissions, uh, usually the minimum is about 80% from the, the six um, high school marks from the requirements. Um, but our students are typically quite a bit stronger than that and, and have a higher grade than 80%. But um, often we get the question, what do I need? So, you know, 80 is, is usually the minimum. Uh, because of the increased interest and, and popularity of the program, it's going to get a little bit more competitive. Um, 
There's no portfolio required. Unlike in architecture, we don't require a portfolio. Um, the court, the high school courses required for admission are listed here. And this is fairly general for all of engineering. And those are the five main professors in the program, but there's lots more, including, I promise, a bit more gender diversity than I'm showing here. Um, and we're also hiring new professors, one in indoor air quality. So that I hope, I hope we can kind of diversify in the near future. Um, so thanks very much, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. I see I have about 15 minutes left. Maybe I'll stop sharing. Are there questions that didn't get answered in the Q&A? I can try to address those as well. It looks like they're all answered, but if if you would like um, clarification from me, please let me know. Um, there was a question that was asked, what softwares are used for this program? Certainly, good question. Um, so I can't name them all, but um, the, the, I can give you the broad categories. So we deal with a lot of um, things like AutoCAD and um, Revit, which is a building information modeling program. Um, we also do a lot of modeling, um, both for structures and also uh, energy performance. So we're using things like um, um, SAP and Energy Plus and eQuest and um, uh, and some specialized programs that look at envelopes like Woofy. So yeah, there, there's a lot of tools. Um, there's also some programming that's not specific to our program, um, but uh, I believe they're using MATLAB for programming, po possibly also Python. Um, do you know what kind of field classes there are and could you discuss them? Um, I'm not quite sure to, how to answer that, but I'll try. So um, something like a third or, or maybe half of courses are associated with a lab. So every course has a lecture that's usually um, three hours per week. In addition to that, there might be a tutorial where um, a teaching assistant will go through examples and, and usually a smaller group so students can you know, feel a little bit more comfortable asking questions. Um, it might be 20 or 30 students in a, a section. Um, other courses involve a lab component. And so the labs might be in a laboratory. Um, you know, if you're doing crushing of specimens or uh, testing water, um, that sort of thing, kind of a chemistry lab or a, a, a structures lab. But there's another set of labs that are done in the field. Um, and I believe there's about three or four courses that have quite a bit of field components. So one is surveying, um, but also a few of them deal with um, heritage structures and going around Ottawa to take measurements. The other thing is that for the fourth year design project, some of the projects involve um, studying a real building and, and making recommendations on how to improve it. So that would also typically be in the field. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. I'm just trying to see if there's any others that are not answered. They all show as answered to me, but, uh, oh, maybe not quite. Okay. There's a question. What kinds of electives can we take? Um, is there a possibility to take French language courses? So the electives, um, this program is a little bit special. Um, often students in engineering can take things like um, psychology, sociology, that sort of what I would call the slightly softer courses, um, the, the less technical courses. In this program, we wanted to ensure that our students are well-rounded in terms of buildings and, and um, cultural aspects, um, the ethics of conservation and things like that. So there's fewer options for electives just because um, our students are, are getting what's known as complementary studies, basically the, the, the non-engineering stuff um, in a slightly more directed way 
because of the importance of understanding um, some of these uh, more social aspects or cultural aspects of buildings. Um, but there's still some options. In first year, you can choose between several uh, more technical courses. Towards um, the later years, you can specialize a little bit more um, with electives in things like, well, really virtually any of the civil or environmental engineering courses can be taken. So you can look a bit more at urban planning, project management, um, water and wastewater, um, some specialized structures courses like looking at earthquake engineering and things like that. Um, there was another question on what are some opportunities abroad? Um, so there's no formal opportunities, but we have, um, I can't get too specific because I, I don't know too much. Um, there's there's a sort of program and I can't remember the name of it, apologies. It's called um, something like alternative um, spring break or, or winter break. Um, and this is an example where you can go abroad um, to look at, um, for example, a building in, in a foreign country. Um, but another opportunity I can speak to this is that um, our, our students often work with professors in sort of short-term research uh, assistantships. So I've had I've hired lots of students, um, some of whom have had the, the privilege to go to a conference in another country or um, somewhere else in Canada. Um, and so that's really something that's arranged sort, sort of informally between the professor, like the student would approach the professor and come to an arrangement and most professors are very eager to hire undergraduate students. Um, some students who are, I, I can't remember what the cutoff is, but sort of in the, the, the higher range of grades um, are offered a automatic co-op with their admission. What this is, is that the university heavily subsidizes for the first summer, um, a co-op position. A lot of those are with professors. Um, so it's only eight weeks but the student will work with the professor. The professor pays something. The university pays a lot, which is wonderful. Um, and I've hired a lot of students like that. Um, in some cases, they keep working for me every summer and then they stay on to do a graduate degree. Um, and that's always my goal is to keep working with students because once you build that relationship, um, it, it's great to maintain it and, and you know keep working together well past the undergraduate degree. So if there's any questions you feel weren't answered to the level you want, please uh, ask them again. Okay, there's a question. After one graduates with a bachelor with this degree, where could one work for heritage conservation? Or is it more of a government job? Uh, no, I mean, on the heritage side, you could work for government, you could work for um, industry. So it's true, a lot of heritage buildings or a lot of interest and in, in budgets for heritage projects are originate with the government, um, but the government doesn't necessarily have the capacity. They don't have the capacity to do the actual engineering work. So they hire that out to consulting companies um, who do the work. And of course, those consulting companies need to hire lots of people. Um, so these would typically be either architecture firms that hire engineers in-house um, or engineering firms that, that are primarily focused on engineering. And these might range from three-person pe three offices to, you know, multinational um, companies like WSP or SNC-Lavalin um, or, or other sort of global companies, RWDI, there, there's lots in Canada has plenty of such companies. A lot of those companies are headquartered in Canada. Um, was there another question? Who was the alumni who worked in Egypt? So that was not an alumni. It's actually one of our professors. His name is Mario Santana. Um, yeah, he's from Venezuela, trained in Belgium. 
and uh, we're lucky enough to have him here in in uh, at Carleton. Okay, well, I'd like to thank you very much for participating in this. Um, it was a pleasure to talk to you. I wish we were all in the same room, um, but hopefully that will happen very soon. And I'd, I'd be happy to um, take questions by email. Um, I can type my email address in the chat. Hopefully you're able to see this and you're welcome to email me. I'm not always the best for sort of administrative or admis admissions questions, but when it comes to specific um, program questions, I'd be very happy to answer them. Thank you all. Have a great day.